Hello, I'm Al Hay, and this is America's Music. I want to welcome you not so much to a sound stage or to a concert, but to a state of mind. Dixieland. What a word. It's been around as long as this century has, perhaps even longer. And all that time, it has conjured up one of the happiest and most exciting forms of American music. You know, a lot of folks have talked about Dixieland as happy music, and it is not hard to see why. Because this was always one kind of jazz where you could take a bunch of total strangers, musicians who never worked together or even talked about what they were going to do, and you just call off the name of a tune and away they'd go, gelling together like old friends and making some of the most cheerful sounds you ever heard. By the time this program of traditional two-beat jazz has ended, you will have been converted. That's guaranteed. We'll do our part. We'll send you away some of the most energetic, the spiciest, and some of the most hummable and beatable sounds in captivity. Now you do your part. Sit back and listen, because the South's about to rise again. Let's get my guys together with Woody Herman, and we're going to show you what I mean. Saxophone. My favorite clarinet is Peanut Huckle, Peanut Huckle. Piano. 
It would take a musical anthropologist to explore the origins of Dixieland. In other words, uh, someone who digs what he digs. You know what I mean? I tell you, New Orleans is the place that Dixieland flourished. Uh, similar ways of playing and phrasing could be heard in Memphis, and St. Louis, and Kansas City, all along the Mississippi Delta. But New Orleans is the convenient genesis for Dixieland jazz, mainly because it was such a melting pot, sort of a witch's cauldron of people and races. At one time, my city had been under Spanish rule, and then French rule, and there were all sorts of Caribbean influences. Uh, Africans were brought there as slaves, the blacks themselves were eventually divided into American Negroes, and we had Creoles who emerged from the old French colonial culture. That's quite a mixture, huh? And from this smorgasbord came such giant legendary figures as King Oliver, and finally, Louis. Louis Armstrong, the great Satchmo. His was a misspent youth. He ended up in the Waif's home in New Orleans. Fortunately for him, and for the world, that's where Louis was taught to play cornet in that reform school's band. Once he learned, his career assumed a direction that was ever upward. He began with Kid Ory's band. He worked the brothels in Storyville. That's New Orleans' infamous red light district. And he went to Chicago in 1922 to join his idol, King Oliver. And by the mid-20s, Louis formed his own outstanding combo. The first one he called the Hot Five, and later the Hot Seven, with which he recorded a number of classic sides. He's widened his reputation so much that by the early 30s, he toured Europe. And by the late 30s, he was even a familiar figure in Hollywood. These are the blues. Nothing but blues. The blues. Some people long ago were searching for a different tune, one that they could croon, but only they can. They only had the rhythm so they started swinging to and fro. From that point on, it was non-stop for Satch. Successful recordings, worldwide tours, movies, radios, television, festivals, the whole gamut. And since Lewis reached his peak in the 20s and 30s as a trumpeter, plus an all-round entertainer. You know, there isn't one trumpeter or jazz singer who doesn't have a little bit of Satchmo in him or her. The reason for closing the gender gap is right here with us tonight. She's a trumpeter, singer, and all-around entertainer, and her name is Clora Bryant. She's from Los Angeles, and she's also established a fine reputation for herself as an educator. Uh, proudly displaying her debt to Louis, here is Cora Bryant performing Sleepy Time Down South. Thank you. I'm gonna dedicate this number and all, my, all of my numbers to the late, great Louis Satchmo Armstrong.
Uh, he was a, a, a terrific influence on me when I was coming up because I came from a small town and all we had were the 78 records and my aunts and my dad collected those like it was they were going out of style. They had a lot of Louis and uh, I listened and I finally got a chance to meet Louis in Las Vegas. We worked at the same at the Riviera. I was in the lounge with Billy Williams and he was in the uh, big room with his band. And I was doing an impression of Louis, so he marched his whole band in the, in the lounge one night, and we both played um, Basin Street Blues together, and it was fantastic. Then after the show, we sat in a booth, and we were talking, and he told me, he says, well, you know, I'm your disciple. I said, no, you're older than I am. You can't be my disciple. I'm your disciple. But it was a warm, he was such a warm, uh, giving person, and I'll always cherish the time that we spent together. For the most part, the instruments of jazz have remained fairly consistent. Players have changed radically, and styles have continued to evolve. But instruments today tend to look and sound pretty much like the instruments around the turn of the century. An instrument around in the beginning was the banjo also, and that seemed to go out of favor in the 30s when the guitar, with its greater sound and greater flexibility as a solo voice, came into prominence. But traditional music lovers, and especially nostalgia buffs, well, they can't get enough of a banjo sound. Nor can the fans of a young phenomenon on banjo by the name of Scotty Plummer. He's a showstopper in the tradition of his idol, Eddie Peabody, the red-headed, freckle-faced kid with a banjo. He was singing and dancing at the age of five, and he began playing banjo at the age of eight. By his 10th year, he was already in demand in Las Vegas. And he spent three years touring with Liberace. Scotty has appeared on the TV movie of the week. And he's made the rounds of all the leading TV talk shows and variety shows. In short, this kid's done it all. And now, he demonstrates the talent that made it possible.
started taking the banjo, I started on lessons when I was about nine years old. And uh, one of my idols at that time was, uh, as you might remember, the great Eddie Peabody, who was the king of the banjo at one time. And one of the great thrills of my life, I guess I'd been playing about, oh, about six months. I had the honor of meeting Eddie Peabody about a month before he passed away. And we spent the day together. In fact, it was in Hollywood here at the Palladium. It was an international banjo convention. And all day I was able to spend with him in the dressing room. And we played and chatted all day. And it was just great thrill. And like any other banjo player that has an idol like that, I have about every record he ever made. For you. you know, during the Dixieland days, although musicians wrote a lot of their own songs, they had a sort of marriage of convenience with Tin Pan Alley. You take a tune like After You've Gone, vintage 1917. I'm sure when Sophie Tucker and the other red-hot mamas of her day began to popularize it, they had no idea that jazz men would take it over and make it an all-time instrumental favorite. And the same thing with Irvin Berlin's Blue Skies. He wrote that for Belle Baker to sing in a Broadway musical. But that melody, and particularly the chords that went with it, seemed perfectly tailored for the horn men to jam on. And that was an era when there was no prohibition against jazz and pop music and blues. They all borrowed from one another. Here's someone who's raring to bring back the original spirit of those songs. And baby, the way she does them, you get the feeling of nostalgia neatly wrapped up with the sound of right here. Here is Miss Della Reese. Nothing but blue skies do I see Blue days, all of them gone Nothing but blue skies from now on I never saw the sun shining so bright I never had things going so right Noticing the days hurrying by When you're in love, oh my, how they fly Blue days, all of them gone Nothing but blue skies from now on Smiling down at me Nothing but blue skies Do I see Blue days They're all gone Nothing but blue skies From now on I never saw the sun shining so bright Never had things going so right Noticing the days hurrying by When you're in love, oh my, how they fly Blue days, they are gone They're gone Nothing but blue skies From now
like a, a nice, simple rendition, and that's what I like about Dixieland. It can be very uh, enjoyable, but it's basic. Blues is basic. I like basic music. I, sometimes I want to show I have a voice and look what I can do with it. But when you really get to groove, Dixieland and blues and gospel are the ones that really are basic and just make you just plain snap your fingers and pat your feet. I like that. I'm so really glad to be working with you again. It's been so long since we've worked together. But it's always fun with you. Yeah, it's always fun with you, too, because you're one of the great jazz singers. And a lot of people don't realize how much jazz you sing. But I remember you in the late Donna Washington when you used to do duets. Yes. You used to be against each other in Vegas. See, that's I what, know how Della That's sings. what's nice about you. See, you remember what I remember. The yeah. rest of them, they don't remember what yeah. I remember. But you remember. All the good things. I remember I like all that stuff. You're right. And I remember your horn and how wonderful it's always made me feel. Uh, could we do a little something together? I have the song already picked out. I was certainly hoping you would ask. Yeah, you know, so I know since we rehearsed all here? evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do Man with the Horn because that's right, apropos, don't right. you think? Yes. All right. Yes. You'll always find me near. The man with a horn Find me there From dusk until dawn That's the place where music is born Oh, you play divine Listen to the way he tells his soul apart. Notice he closes his eyes right from the start. You can feel the music pour from his heart. So fine, sweetly. Oh, he plays so well. I am completely cut that out. Play your You're in the mood for music and love. Just forget about the stars up over. And you'll find, my dear, that you.
father was a policeman in New Orleans, and he had a partner who had a son named George Hartman, who was a trumpet player, and I was fascinated by the instrument. And uh, I asked my father to get me one. So he went down to a pawn shop, and he bought one for five bucks. And uh, George Hartman became our first teacher. And he went on to New York uh, to play jazz music, and I, I started uh, studying with a, a real legitimate teacher who had uh, studied with, Cre played with Creator's band. And, uh, and uh, he taught me all through high school, grade school and high school. And then I went to the University of Illinois and I met Dr. Frank Simon. And through Dr. Frank Simon, who was an artist teacher and who had, was a cornet soloist with John Philip Sutton, uh, he was a head of music at the Cincinnati Conservatory. So fortunately, I received a scholarship there and started studying with him. And then uh, to supplement my income, I started playing with dance bands. And uh, I got to where I could play pretty good in the section. Never played any jazz of any kind. And then World War II came along, and I was in the service, and I played, and I got to st start getting interested in jazz. And uh, bands like Tommy Darcy and Jimmy Darcy and, and uh, you know, uh, Benny Goodman and so forth. When I got out of the service, I played with a few named bands. Then I went back to New Orleans. And then, all of a sudden, then, I became aware of Louis Armstrong, the sounds in New Orleans, and I said, wow, this has been going on here, and I never heard it. Then I realized, you know, what, what a fantastic player Pops was, and then I started studying the history and the jazz, the legends of jazz. At that age, after I'd been playing uh, since age six, and now I'm in my 20s, you know, in my 20 years old. And then I got interested in jazz, and the first band I worked with was Ina Ray Hutton, and then I started every now and then jump up and do a chorus, you know? And then I started playing some jazz. And then I played lead all the time, the first trumpet player, and jazz trumpet. I tried to do a little bit of all of it. And then gradually I got back into New Orleans, started playing with a small group. Pete Fountain was a member of it, and, and started hitting it from there. Got lucky with it.
you ever try to describe a living legend to someone in 30 or 40 seconds? Well, it just isn't possible. But if you got the time, I've got the incentive to try. For our next guest is indeed a legend. His name is Johnny Guaneri. And his career runs parallel to the development of the piano in jazz. It would be possible to say he picked up where Fats Waller left off. Not only in stride piano, but also in, in writing. And it would also be flattering because Johnny fell in love with Fats when he was growing up in New York City. And Fats Waller, of course, carried on the Harlem, or the, what we call a stride technique, and that was uh, done by James P. Johnson. So the continuity in one of the richest idioms of America's music is intact. His background is, is strictly classical, but his accent is fully jazz. His credits cover quite a cross-section. He was pianist with Jimmy Darcy, twice with Benny Goodman, with Raymond Scott and with Artie Shaw. And with Artie's band, Johnny was featured with that wonderfully innovative combo, the Gramercy Five. He's one of the most recorded pianists in history. Johnny can be heard on over 6,000 recordings. And if you check with ASCAP, that's the American Society of Composers and Publishers, you'll find over 3,500 compositions bearing his name, and many of them classical. That should come as no surprise, since he's a descendant of the Guanarius family of violin makers. Maybe it would be heresy to mention the competition, but the best way I know of to bring him on is to say, here he is, the Stradivarius of pianists, Johnny Guaneri. Stride piano was a rebellion of the great many young black pianists who lived in Harlem against the older ragtime music. And the stride part of it was the left hand. It grew from an octave into, into ten notes. That was one of the features of it. Then there was a constant pulsation of going back and forth with the left hand not necessarily playing octaves as the uh, uh, ragtime people did, but also uh, filling in this 
back and forth routine while the right hand played combinations against against these passing figures and the great prolific stride pianists then were not satisfied with just going back and forth they would hit a chord two notes and then hit a bass note especially james p johnson would do that don't don't boom don't boom don't boom boom and so many variations uh, developed but the stride was a motivating feature and it was best exemplified by uh, the great Fats Waller. Uh, that's it for America's music. And I guess that's it for Dixieland. So stay well, brothers and sisters, and keep swinging. Dixieland in terms of big bands, but there was an exceptionally fine outfit that specialized in a Dixieland brand of swing, or what we call orchestrated Dixieland, Bob Crosby's band. Here's Bob Crosby with some of his original sidemen. Thank you. Bob Crosby and the Bobcats and the happy sound of New Orleans Dixieland Jazz. Take it, Gene.
The story behind the big noise from Winnetka is rather weird. We used to do Sunday afternoon tea dances at the Black Hawk restaurant in Chicago. And the suburb of Chicago is a little town called Winnetka, not far from Northwestern University. And the students from Northwestern and Winnetka uh, used to come in to those Sunday afternoon sessions. And we were crowded one afternoon. In fact, there was no place for anyone to dance. They sat on the dance floor. And we played almost our entire library. And I said to them, what do you want now? They said, play another one, play another one. So I turned to Baduk, Ray Baduk, my drummer, Bob Haggard, my bass player, and I said, play the blues. And I turned back to the audience and I said, we're now going to do a thing called Big Noise from Winnetka. And they just, off the top of their head, ad-libbed the thing. A little later on, we were making a record date. And in those days, you had to do two sides or four sides. You couldn't do one or three. And we finished three sides, and the fourth arrangement didn't work out. And we had about 10 minutes left on the record date. And just for fun, I said, let's do Big Noise from Winnetka. So Haggard started, started with a silly whistle. He had an opening here in the front teeth. I can't emulate it. And uh, the record came out, and we were amazed to find out it became a jazz classic. It was purely accidental. It was beautifully done and required great musicianship and uh, a sense of humor, which I think music should have.
Kusra's mother. The Hessians are coming. The Hessians are coming. You know, in one way, that means Jim and Martha Hessian, piano and voice, respectively. But in a more dramatic way, it means the story of two white musicians from Pasadena and a black legend from Harlem. There ain't no way to speak of the Hessians without acknowledging the role Newby Blake played in their lives and career. Jim Hessian met the durable Newby at a piano player's party in Los Angeles, and the chemistry was instantaneous. They concertized together on both coasts, and Jim became the first new artist to be introduced on Yubi's record label. Jim and Martha both started out as classical music students at UCLA. She played banjo and sang, and he played every conceivable style of piano in existence. They spent a great deal of time working for Walt Disney Productions, and they've spent even more time educating listeners on America's music, which is why they're here tonight.
quite often when some unhip writer tries to describe the art of scat singing, he ends up calling it nonsense syllables. It may sound like gibberish, but rest assured, it has a logic and purpose all its own. It stems from a singer's frustration with the limitations of lyrics. And when a singer begins to swing and his musical temperature arises, mere words are not enough to express his ideas. One of the best scat singers around just happens to be with us tonight. His name, Scatman Crullers. The gal look, yeah, I've got a gal I know ain't true. Her boyfriend's number, quite a few. I should quit. What can I do? The gal looks good. Yeah, she's got a heart just like a rock. Always keeps me deep in hock. She's made me the laughing stock. The gal looks good. Yeah, the gal looks good. Sorry, do baby. The gal looks good Jack I'm sorry the gal looks good oh, oh, oh. the gal looks good yeah the gal looks so good Jack I'm sorry the gal looks good now I know she goes with another guy her back door slams when I pass by I should quit but how can I the gal looks yeah, I say, kiss me, honey. She says, nope. Slaps my face and scram, you dope. All I can do is hope and hope. Gal looks good. Yeah, the gal looks good. Mmm, the gal looks so good. Jack, I'm sorry. The gal looks good. Ho, ho, ho. The gal looks good. Yeah, the gal looks so good. Jack, I'm sorry, the gal looks good. Now, a pal of mine gave me a friendly tip about her boyfriend who's hard to whip. But I would chance one busted lip. The gal looks good. Yeah, I would enter a danger door, smack a line and damn the roar. I never felt this way before. The gal looks good. Yeah. the people of Los Angeles, for they have in their midst their very own Louis Armstrong. His name, uh, Teddy Buckner, born in Texas, raised in California. He paid his dues with such great leaders as Lionel Hampton, Benny Carter, and Kid Ory. But he gained his greatest fame as the leader of his own Dixieland combo. And that, for years, was featured on the Disneyland replica of a Mississippi steamboat. Teddy, he's never tried to hide the fact that his idol was always Louis Armstrong. One of Teddy's most prized possessions is a trumpet that Lewis gave uh, him in 1934. And Teddy's also proud of the fact that he once stood in for Satch in a movie. Buckner was also in a movie called King of Burlesque with Fats Waller. And then Teddy, I remember very well seeing him in Pete Kelly's Blues. Teddy Buckner's living proof that Dixieland is one of America's most durable art forms. So here's that durable man himself to play. Strutting with some barbecue.
about a century ago, the piano became sort of a centerpiece of American music. With no radio or any other way to make music, even households that couldn't afford it had a piano for home entertainment. So, of course, it was the piano that gave birth to the lilting, syncopated accents of ragtime. You know, they say ragtime was based on black dance music. And by the late 1890s, contests for cakewalking dances and ragtime piano were all the rage. The tune that got the whole era on the way was Maple Leaf Rag by Scott Joplin. Joplin uh, didn't care much about improvisation. He had a thorough musical education, and all 53 of his piano pieces in his ragtime ballet and two operas, they were all as carefully constructed as a Georgia mansion. Little by little, ragtime evolved into a less formal, more improvised music. Here's Willie the Lion Smith, who crossed the bridge between ragtime and the stride piano of the 20s. And now, here's a glimpse of the most famous stride man of them all, playing his own honeysuckle rose, the one and only Thomas Fat Swallow.
This is the biggest jazz standard of the 20s. Tiger Rag, which features the growling and sliding of trombone man Bob Havens. In 1983, we lost the last link between jazz and the ragtime era when U.B. Blake dies just five days after his 100th birthday. Some experts say there's no connection between ragtime and Dixieland or any other kind of jazz, but it's interesting. A lot of the early rags were written as marches. Some of them even had the word march in the title. Uh, the brass bands playing parade music in the streets of New Orleans picked up on some of these tunes. Two of the very first records ever made was Tiger Rag and Sensation Rag by the original Dixieland Jazz Band in 1917. There were even records of Tiger Rag and Scott Joplin's original rags played by Jelly Roll Martin. And those old rags and stomps and blues have shown pretty good staying power. There was a parallel vocal movement uh, in 1923 the same year when King Oliver made the very first series of black jazz band records, Bessie Smith made her record debut with Downhearted Blues. And it was a tremendous bestseller. And then the blues spread first in theaters up north and down south, all around the Gulf Coast, even on the riverboats, where the pioneer New Orleans band played. I am very proud to introduce a singer from Ponchatoula, Louisiana, 
who's brought the righteous sounds to a new generation. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, the queen of New Orleans song, Miss Irma Thomas. <laughs>
One of the most remarkable aspects of Dixieland jazz is the function it played in funerals, especially in my hometown of New Orleans. The fact that Dixieland could turn a funeral into a vibrant, swinging affair shows just how potent the message can be. Now let me set the scene for you regarding a typical funeral for some jazz luminaries. Uh, you get a band together, march to the burial spot, all the time playing some mournful Baptist hymns, such as Just a Closer Walk with Deep. Of course, the idea behind it was obvious. The man was gone, he was buried, but living had to go on. And the best way to remember someone is with the joyful sounds of swing. And if you think such affairs are limited to Dixieland musicians, let me tell you something. I saw Dizzy Gillespie participating in plenty of those swinging comebacks. He loved them. And you're gonna love this version of the South Rampart Street Parade. Now, don't think of it as a funeral. Think of it as our way of saying goodnight for America's music. <laughs> 